So I did, as Aaron mentioned, get interested in Edith Wilson because I've written two books on the suffrage movement and when I was giving talks like this one, regardless of audience, regardless of geography, someone would ask me about Edith Wilson. There's sort of a narrative out there in the world that Woodrow Wilson, who dragged his feet on supporting the 19th Amendment, that maybe he changed his mind in 1918 because she whispered in his ear. Maybe she was responsible for him coming around on suffrage. It's totally not true. She was anti-suffrage. He changed his mind purely for reasons of electoral math. But I started looking into her to answer those questions better because they predictably would happen in almost every talk I gave. And I realized that the books that exist about Edith are either, frankly, sexist garbage, or <laughs> um, they really only talk about her time as First Lady. And I get why. Her time as First Lady was totally fascinating. But you can't understand her as a human if you're only looking at those couple of years. So if you know anything about Edith Wilson, you know that in 1919, when Woodrow Wilson had a stroke, she stepped in and took the reins of the executive branch and really acted as president for months, for an astounding amount of time. This was not a couple of days sort of a thing. And she and his doctor and his secretary, who was his title was secretary, who functioned as chief of staff, kept that secret from everybody from the public, from the press, from the Congress, from the cabinet, from the vice president, from the president himself. He never knew how sick he was. And as, as I say, I get why people focus on that moment. That is astounding and unconstitutional and all kinds of other things. Um, but if you don't know who Edith is, you think, what? How could she have the nerve to step in and play that role? Well, she showed her nerve over and over again throughout the rest of her life, and that's why I find her so interesting. So I'd like to start with this picture because this is a moment. This is in spring of 1920. Um, Wilson's stroke was in October of 1919, and he was not seen in public. Not seen in public from October 2nd of 1919 until April of 1920. And when finally there was enough pressure, from mainly the press, but others saying, if he's okay, let us see him, and if he's not okay, we need to know that, that they sort of propped him up in a car and drove him around town. <laughs> so this, you can see Edith keeping a pretty wary eye on him, and this is his doctor, Carrie Grayson, who was one of the three people in the new, no, also with keeping an eye apart, and they found a cape coat that he could wear because he couldn't get his left arm in the sleeve of a coat. So, um, this is sort of the moment that everybody knows about Wilson, but let's go back and learn a little bit more about who Edith was and where she came from. So uh, this is Edith Bowling, age three. She looks really grouchy. I think she mainly looks grouchy because she's wearing pants. It is the only picture I've ever seen of her where she is not beautifully dressed. Um, she was born in Withville, Virginia. Withville is um, in the southwest of Virginia. Uh, in the Appalachian foothills, and um, she was the sixth of nine children of uh, Southern planters. They had been tobacco planters in the James River Valley. They enslaved 100 people when the Civil War happened, and slavery no longer became the economic model to sustain plantation lifestyle. They couldn't survive economically, and moved to Withville to this funny little series of rooms. I think the next picture is their house. Um, so if you see, the house still exists. I actually took this picture from the roof of the hotel across the street. So the street level is storefronts. The second level is the family home. And the third level is a false gable. Um, and you can see the mountains are right there. So Edith and her siblings and her parents and both her grandmothers and a couple of aunts and a cousin or two and various law students and other hangers on all lived in this little room. <laughs> so Edith easily could have gotten lost in that shuffle, right, the six of nine children. Um, and her mother, um, as well as her parents, uh, her mother was a Southern Belle um, and very, very traditional um, and very much part of that kind of Victorian cult of true womanhood. The ideal woman is pious and submissive and domestic and pure. Um, and those were the lessons that Sally was imparting to her daughters. 
Mr. Bowling was uh, a judge. He was a man of some prominence in Whitfield, um, but he had all these kids and all these hangers on, and so his, he was really kind of the load-bearing wall of this family. Um, and his mother also lived with them. So in contrast to Sally and Sally's mother's lessons of the cult of true womanhood, Grandmother Bowling, who was terrifying. <laughs> this is, I mean, I know this is sort of a Whistler's mother's picture, but she she wore, you know, traditional hoop skirts. She wore one of those morning brooches made of human hair. And that item on the back of her rocking chair is the tanned skin of her favorite dog. Oh. <laughs> it's so gothic and weird, right? And um, she was fierce. And she ruled the household from this rocking chair throne. And she, for reasons known only to her, plucked Edith out as her favorite. It was a mixed blessing. Edith had to do a lot for Grandmother Bowling. But Grandmother Bowling taught her to read and write, taught her to read the Bible, taught her French. Grandmother Bowling had taught herself French, so her pronunciation was a little eccentric, which would come back to remind Edith when she actually went to Paris. Um, but really told Edith that she was strong and she could rely on her own opinion and that her self-confidence was well-founded. And I don't want to do a ton of psychoanalysis of somebody 150 years after their birth, but I do think that these contrasting lessons of one grandmother telling her she should be strong and confident and one grandmother and mother telling her she should be submissive and pure explained a lot about Edith and how she would often cloak her private actions in this public veneer of femininity. Um, she, by nature, leaned much towards the fierce and confident side. That was really who she was innately. But she kept throughout her life trying to pretend she was striving for that cult of true womanhood ideal. So one of the things she had to do as her grandmother's favorite was take care of her grandmother's canaries. She hated the canaries. Um, the only time she liked the canaries was when one died and she and her brother Will were allowed to put on elaborate bird funerals. Um, so this is teenage Edith on the back porch of her house in Whitville with the canary cages. And she seems so wistful, right? She's sort of looking towards the future. What can I be? How can I get out of Whitville and away from these canaries? And uh, she really did envision something more for herself, something grander, something on a larger scale. And at age 18, she left Whitfield and moved here to Washington. She had a sister, an older sister, who had married a man named Alexander Galt. They lived at like 23rd and F in Foggy Bottom. They had a baby and needed some help. And Edith was done with the very little formal schooling she had had. The family didn't have enough money to keep educating girls. She had three younger brothers. Um, and so she came here to Washington, and it was 1890. And think about 1890 Washington, right? It's that Gilded Age boom time, where if you drive up Massachusetts Avenue, you can play like Gilded Age Mansion, you know, point to the Cosmos Club and the um, Anderson House and the Indonesian Embassy. And like, yeah, those were all really rich people's private homes in 1890. It became as fashionable to have a winter home in Washington as it was to have a summer home in Newport. And one of the reasons for that is because Washington was new enough that the people who cared about who your ancestors were couldn't really track them that long. The roots here were pretty shallow. And also, everyone was coming and going because of the federal government, as they are today. And so, you know, if you think about like Mark Twain and Edith Wharton, who wrote books about the Gilded Age, they had characters who moved here to Washington because New York society was so hidebound, and if you weren't one of Mrs. Astor's 400, you couldn't really break in. But in Washington, you could. So that's the world Edith moved into. And she didn't have any money, but she did sort of have dreams of being someone more. And so she comes here to Washington. She's living with her sister. Her sister's husband, Alexander Galt, had a cousin named Norman Galt. Norman Galt ran Galt's. Do you guys remember Galt's Jewelers? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, was on, it was downtown until like 2002 or 3. <laughs> Galt's Jewelers started in 1802 when Washington was a construction site, more or less. And it was the high-end silver and jewelry store for the city for 200 years. And um, so Norman Galt was a man of some status. He ran a high-end business. He was a total upstanding citizen. He was on all the right boards. He was on the church vestry. 
He was maybe a little boring. <laughs> he was definitely a little fussy. Uh, he was significantly older than Edith, but he was smitten with her, with the teenage Edith. And um, I mean, you can see why, right? Look at how beautiful she was. And so Norman starts courting Edith. Edith claims to want nothing to do with him, not wanting to get married. She's enjoying being a young woman about town. But then she kind of realizes that she can't live in her sister's house forever, and she's going to have to go back to Whitfield if she doesn't marry. <laughs> so she marries Norman. Norman represents security and status. And they had one baby who didn't survive, but they enjoyed being a couple of some you know, means and respect. And then, this is Galt's. Um, and so they bought a house on 20th Street. It doesn't survive. They lived in the left side of this duplex. It was on 20th between Ann and O. Um, so DuPont Circle, which was very fashionable at the turn of the century. And then in 1908, Norman died, and he left Galt's to her, which was really unusual, right? Um, women's inheritance laws were still pretty murky around the turn of the century, and had his father been alive, or had they had children, or had his brother not been an invalid, um, in other words, had there been a man who might have challenged that state of affairs, it's entirely possible that Edith would not have been able to hang on to Galt's, but she did, and she, she kept it. She didn't sell it, she managed it. Um, and so she became a woman with status that was very unusual in 1908. She didn't have kids, she had money, she didn't need a chaperone, she was a widow. And she had control over her own independence and her own wealth. And she was really good at it. She really enjoyed being a wealthy widow of means. She became the first woman to get a driver's license in Washington, D.C., if you can believe it. Um, and what she drove was this little electric car, top speed, 13 miles an hour. It looks like a golf cart, right? It, it largely was a golf cart. Early cars were so smelly and difficult, you had to crank them, and you know they were noisy, and women wanted no part of them. But these little electric cars, were clean and easy, and the car makers understood that they could market them to sort of urban, fashionable women. And there were bud vases on the dash, and there was a vanity case built in to make them very feminine. And you can see she's holding this kind of tiller. That was how they steered it. It was quite a conveyance. So as you might imagine, Edith became known for zipping around town in this remarkable little thing. And um, no one was really paying much attention to Edith before then in terms of writing down uh, records of her life, but in a lot of the memoirs of the first couple of decades of the 20th century, and a lot of like society hostesses wrote delicious memoirs, they mentioned Mrs. Galt and her electric car. Because uh, when she had to get from her house on 20th Street to Galt's on Pennsylvania Avenue, she had to cross at 15th in Pennsylvania, and she always ignored the pedestrian and just plowed right on through in her little electric car. So she. She became known about cat. And also look at the hats and the dress. And, you know, she was always quite fabulous. She went to Europe every year. Um, she became very, very stylish. Uh, this picture is now the cover of my book um, because she looks, you know, I love that she's shoulders back, kind of facing whatever is going to come. Uh, but this is the woman who caught the eye of the president, this lovely, stylish, independent, wealthy woman about town the woman she imagined she could be when she was sitting on that back por porch in Whitville complaining about the parents. Um, so she's enjoying that life. Meanwhile, over in the White House, and frankly, this book just came out last week, so I haven't given this talk a ton, so I'm not always sure what slide's coming next, so bear with me. So um, Woodrow Wilson, as I'm sure you all know, was elected in 1912. This is his family. Um, this is daughter Margaret, wife Ellen, daughter Nell, daughter Jessie. Um, and he was a little bit of an accidental president. Um, if you remember the 1912 election, Teddy Roosevelt insisted on running as a third party candidate, split the Republican vote with William Howard Taft. Really, any Democrat would have been elected, uh, but it was Woodrow Wilson, who had been in politics for like a minute and a half. He had been president of Princeton University he became governor of New Jersey in 1910, took office in 1911, ran for president in 1912. Um, Ellen, Washington was not her natural habitat, let's just put it that way. Ellen was a well-educated, lovely woman, very accomplished painter, 
She was great in academia. When she got here to Washington, the gossip columns made fun of how dowdy her clothes were and how her hair was in an old-fashioned style and she was shy and she just wasn't good at that ceremonial part of First Lady and she really never warmed to it at all. Um, her daughters were a little better at it, but they were young single women and enjoying that status. And in fact, within the first two years of the Wilson administration, Nell and Jesse, the two on your right, both got married in the White House and moved out. In 1914, um, Ellen died. She uh, died in the White House in August of 1914. At that point, Margaret, the only daughter left home, was trying to be a singer, and she was sort of out on tour trying to make a name for herself uh, as a performer. And so there wasn't really a first lady in the White House. Um, I think the next slide actually is a campaign poster, just so you meet Woodrow Wilson and Thomas Marshall in the 1912 campaign. Um, and uh, the president was, by all accounts, truly heartbroken over Ellen's death. They had been married for over 30 years. She was one of his closest confidants. He was not a man who had a big team of advisors. He had two or three people he really trusted, and Ellen was one of them. And his doctor, Carrie Grayson, who we met in the first slide, was really genuinely worried about him. He was depressed, and war was heating up in Europe, and he really needed to be on his game. And he, he didn't have any foreign policy experience. He had never been in that international position, so he was sort of out of his depth politically and grieving personally. And Carrie Grayson was good friends with Edith Galt, um, because Carrie Grayson was courting Edith's friend, Altrude. I think Altrude's the next slide. Yes, Alice Gertrude, known as Altrude. Um, which, ugh. But, um, <laughs> so, Carrie and Altrude had this on-again, off-again romance. Because you all are local, a little trivia. They did get married, they did have children. After the White House, they moved to the house that is now the admissions building for Sidwell. The, that that building with the columns right across from Fannie Mae, that was, yeah, the Grayson's home. Um, so Carrie says to Edith, go make friends with the president's cousin. The president's cousin, Helen Bones, is the only person left in the White House doing any kind of First Lady-ish stuff. So that's Helen on the left, Carrie Grayson in the middle, Nell Wilson McAdoo. At, they're at the races. Um, <laughs> Helen, th there wasn't a ton of first ladying to do. The White House was in mourning, but there was some stuff, and it was left to her, this sort of shy, meek cousin, um, to take care of it. And so Carrie Grayson says to Edith, go make friends with Helen. Go be nice. And Edith says, no. <laughs> I don't want any part of official Washington. I mean, you all know your locals, right? Like, there's the city, and there's the federal city, and sometimes you don't always cross that line. And Carrie Grayson said, you don't need to be any part of official Washington. They're in mourning. They're not doing anything official. Just go be a friend. Go take her for walks in Rock Creek Park. That's what he suggested. So Edith, you know, better manners prevailed, and she made friends with Helen Bones, and they did go for regular walks in Rock Creek Park. And then they'd go back to Edith's house on 20th Street for tea. And one day, Helen sort of weirdly insisted that they go to the White House for tea instead. And she was not an insisting kind of a gal. And Edith said, I We've just been walking in the park. My boots are muddy. I'm not going to the White House. And Helen said, yes, you are. It's important to me. I can't always be the guest. You have to let me be the host sometimes. We won't see anybody. We'll go up the back elevator. We'll go straight to the private quarters. It'll be fine. Don't worry about your boots. It was a total setup. They go to the White House. They go up the elevator. The elevator doors open, and they are Carrie Grayson and the president. <laughs> Carrie Grayson and Helen had conspired to introduce Edith to the president trying to make a match. Well, they totally succeeded. The president was absolutely a god from the moment he met her. He just fell totally head over heels. And the way we know that is their love letters survive. So as I mentioned, I've written a lot about the suffrage movement. When you write about the suffrage movement, you do not learn to love Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> and his um, intellectual snobbery and his sort of Calvinistic priggishness um, were characteristics he cultivated in himself. He really liked being seen as this sort of distant, superior intellect. 
Well, let me tell you, his love letters are racy. <laughs> and you're like, how is Woodrow Wilson writing these steamy letters? It made me like him more, actually. And from the beginning, his letters, and it's also just as a historian delightful to read first person narratives like that because they're not curated and they didn't, you know, expect me to be reading their mail a hundred years later. And so his letters are, you're the most beautiful, wonderful creature I've ever seen, and I want to kiss your eyelids, and just on and on and on. And her letters back from the very beginning are, that's nice. Can we talk about the Carranza government in Mexico? It seems like there's going to be another revolution there. You know, um, what's going on? What are you going to write back to Germany about sinking the Lusitania? I'd really like to edit that letter because your first one was not great. And it's extraordinary that this you know, girl from Whitville is insisting on being part of his life. He proposed five weeks after they met. Wow. She turned him down. She thought they didn't know each other very well. And, but agreed to keep seeing him and get to know him better. And literally the next day, so this is the day after he has proposed marriage for the first time, he writes her a letter about how my heart breathes for you and you're the ideal woman. She writes him a letter that says, you know, we were starting to have a really interesting conversation last night about William Jennings Bryan. Do you think he's going to resign as Secretary of State? Who do you think is going to take his place? Maybe you should appoint me. <laughs> what? <laughs> so finally, Woodrow catches on that policy analysis is the way to Edith's heart. And he doesn't stop with the kissing your eyelids letters, but he adds to his love letters these big packets of legislation and correspondence, and he taught her his personal cipher so she could decode diplomatic correspondence, like, security issues be damned, these big packets are going back and forth to 20th Street so that she could be in the know. And she loved it, and her letters over the summer of 1915 do start to get a little bit more sentimental, never as far as his, but she does start to add some terms of endearment and tell him how wonderful he is. So finally, by the fall of 1915, she said she'd marry him if he lost. <laughs> she, she didn't want to be first lady. She didn't want to marry the president. She wanted him. And she was very aware of being seen as a social climber. Not a gold digger, because he had no money and she had money. But she didn't, as she said, I, I'm worried people will think I'm marrying the office, not the man. Um, and so she said, if you lose re-election in 1916, I'll marry you then. <laughs> and all he heard was, I'll marry you and started telling everybody they were engaged. And um, by the fall of 1915, she did come around and say, okay, I'm all in, win or lose, I will marry you. And they got married at her house in DuPont Circle in December of 1915. So 1916 was, uh, oh, that's her first official portrait. 1916 was an election year. Um, so she joined him on the campaign trail. She was pretty good at it. She never gave any speeches. She decided that she was Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. She served the man, not the nation. Um, but she showed up everywhere and she looked appropriate and she shook all the right hands and she made the host feel important. And she was good at all of that side of campaigning. The 1916 election was a nail biter. Um, it looked like, this will all sound very familiar, what's all this new again, on election night, it wasn't clear who had won. They needed to get the returns in from California. California had enfranchised women by then, as had a few other states in the West. And there was some concern that new women voters would vote against Wilson because he had moved on too fast from his first wife, and they wouldn't like that. But as it happened, women did vote for him, and he won California in part because of the women's vote, and that put him over the top. And so he was elected for a second term. And then 1917 happens. And suddenly the U.S. is involved in World War I. Um, this is Edith's official portrait as First Lady. She loved this painting. It hangs in the White House. Um, it, this is not a super reproduction of it. You can't really see the detail, but she's wearing this uh, mantle that with a fur collar and cuffs. And then it's, it's hyper-feminine, right? I mean, it's pink, it's lacy. She's got that sort of demure hand up there. Um, and she really liked this portrait. This is how she very much liked being portrayed. This is Woodrow Wilson, not the First Lady. Um, so in 1917, the U.S. gets involved in World War I. She was a pretty good wartime First Lady. She did all the right things in terms of uh, championing food conservation, the week was Wednesdays and meat was Mondays and all that. She had sheep grazing the White House lawn so that the 
landscapers for the White House were freed up for other work. That was clever and very visible, right? Everybody saw this example of shared sacrifice. And then when the sheep got really woolly, she auctioned off their wool to benefit the Red Cross. If you go to the Woodrow Wilson House on S Street in Calorama, there's this incredibly weird shadow box in the downstairs foyer that has some of that sheep wool in it. And you're like, why is there this glass bulb of filthy wool on the wall? And it's because it was some of those World War I sheep. And then um, World War I ends, the president insisted on going to Paris himself to negotiate the peace treaty. That was controversial. Excuse me. First of all, no president had really left the country for more than like an afternoon. You know, Roosevelt checking on the progress of the Panama Canal kind of thing. Um, and he was going to be gone a long time. Treaty negotiations take a while, especially in an era before global telecommunications, having the president gone was going to be an issue. But also there was some question of, was he ceding the moral high ground by getting his hands dirty with the nitty gritty of negotiations, where if he stayed here and sort of issued judgments from on high, he could maintain his um, moral superiority. That he was always going to go. He, the way he justified US involvement in World War I was to have a seat at the table. We didn't have territory at stake. There was no existential threat to the US. What he wanted was a voice in the peace. And he had this vision for the League of Nations, for this global pact that would ensure global peace. And he wanted to be there to make sure that it was in the treaty. Well, where Wilson went, Edith went. So she showed up in Paris, too. And no, no First Lady had ever been abroad at all while First Lady. So suddenly, she's there in all the pictures. She's there on all the daises. She's accepting awards. She's um, standing next to the King and Queen of England. She's on the front page of every paper. And just by showing up, she elevated the role of First Lady on the international stage. And everyone loved her. She was really good at it. Wilson was quite shy. And he was one of those people who was, didn't want to put a toe wrong. He wanted to know what all the protocol was. He wanted to know what everyone was wearing. He wanted to just make sure he was doing it all right. But he didn't want to be seen not knowing that it was right. Whereas Edith would just, you know, as in every other stage in her life, she just figured it out. She just would barrel her way in and use her terrible French and ask, are we, are we wearing gloves to dinner? What's going on? And would smooth the way for him. Um, and the main source for a lot of this, by the way, is her memoir. She wrote a memoir in 1938. It's delightful, frank, funny. It is also, at points, demonstrably untrue. And so you have to take her as an unreliable narrator of her own life. Um, and so where possible, I had to verify what she was saying. I couldn't verify that her grandmother was terrifying. I could verify what was going on in Paris. There were plenty of other accounts. Um, so they are in Paris. They are out on all these parades. This is a picture of, you know, they, um, the Parisians heralded Wilson as a, as a great liberator, right? So people would throw roses in their carriage. And uh, pictures like these were on the front page of every newspaper all over the world. And the First Lady had not been a globally prominent role before that. And now, you know, that sort of public diplomacy bit is something we really expect of our First Ladies. Um, but this was the first time anyone had seen that happen. Wilson got quite sick in Paris. Um, it was 1918. There was a flu epidemic. <laughs> he got a flu. It might not have been the Spanish flu, but he got a flu. He got quite sick. He had never been super robust anyway. When they came back here to America in the summer of 1919, they were gone the better part of six months. They came back once in March to close the previous Congress and open the next Congress, but they were really only here for a week. So they were largely gone for six months. And when he came back and introduced the treaty to the Senate, the Senate fought back. They, um, the Republicans had taken control of the Senate in the 1918 midterms, and they didn't want to ratify the treaty as written. They worried, especially about the League, that the ability to declare war would be wrested away from the Congress, and it would be this automatic thing because of the uh, requirements of the pact. And so through the summer of 1919, Wilson's fighting with the Senate over the treaty. And he won't compromise at all. Woodrow Wilson won't compromise at all. There, there are members of the Congress who are saying, I actually would ratify this if you made these small changes. And he won't. It's all or nothing with Woodrow. And he finally decides the only way he's going to get his beloved League of Nations passed is to take it to the people. 
And so he decides he's gonna embark on a cross-country train tour and introduce the idea of the League to the masses, and there they'll then see the righteousness of it and pressure their elected officials. That's a terrible idea. You don't take a sick, exhausted man and put him on a thousand degree metal train car and truck him around the country and have him shake hundreds of hands and give dozens of speeches. It's just a total recipe for disaster. And everyone tried to stop him. Edith tried to stop him. Carrie Grayson tried to stop him. This is Joe Tumulty, um, the man who was the third in the conspiracy that would come, uh, his chief of, for all intents and purposes, chief of staff. None of them could talk him out of it. They go on the train tour. Everyone just decides, okay, we'll go with you and sort of save you from your worst impulses. The train tour is just as terrible as they imagined it would be. He starts having headaches so crucial that they literally leave him blind at times. He starts slurring his words on the stump. It's terrible. Finally, uh, just outside of Pueblo, Colorado, collapsed on the train. And um, Edith and Tumulty and Grayson convinced him he could not go on. Train tours canceled. They come racing back here to Washington. He was sort of well enough when they got back here to wave to the crowds at Union Station, but then sent on to the White House to recover. And these very vague bulletins are coming out of the White House that he's suffering from nervous indigestion. And I don't know what that is. That's not a thing. Uh, nervous exhaustion, right? These are not clinical diagnoses. But it's this vague, he'll be fine. He needs rest, he'll recover. On October 2nd, 1919, he suffers a massive, massive stroke. His whole left side was paralyzed. His life actually hung in the balance for about a week. Even once he was out of mortal danger, he became a very, very sick man. He was bedridden, um, his speech was slurred, he would find it very hard to concentrate and follow a conversation, um, and he was very weak physically. So, Edith claims in her memoir that the doctors came to her, this is how she justifies it, but the doctors came to her and said, if he is brought any bad news, if he faces any stress, if he has to get up and walk around, if anyone bothers him, he will die. Okay? So if he is the president of the United States, he will die. But he can't quit because the only thing he's living for is to see the League of Nations. And so if he quits, you will take away his whole motivation for getting better. So if he quits, he'll die. If he dies, we'll never see world peace. Those are the stakes that Edith claimed she was given. He can't be president, he can't quit, and if he dies, global war forever. So from her point of view, the only thing she could do was do his job for him until he was better enough to do it himself. And she and Tumulty and Grayson made that happen. She took all meetings. She decided who saw him, which was basically no one. She drafted public statements. She, people, if people needed something from the president, they had to put it in writing, address it to her. She would then claim she took it to the president. Sometimes she did, sometimes she didn't. And she would then answer the issue. And this went on throughout the fall of 1919 and the spring of 1920. He didn't meet with his cabinet at all. Um, he certainly wasn't seen in public. He didn't give any speeches. He didn't give any interviews. Um, and that's preposterous, right? No one elected Edith to anything. You might wonder, where was the vice president, the person actually elected to step in? Well, there wasn't a 25th Amendment yet. So the succession plan was very murky. There is language about it in the Constitution, but it doesn't specify whether they, he becomes acting president or actual president, and more to the point, it doesn't specify who makes the call that the president is incapacitated. And anybody who might make that, like say his doctor, was not going to. Also, the vice president was a clown. The vice president, Thomas Marshall, had been added to the ticket purely for Indiana's electoral votes. <laughs> he was sort of a court jester type. He wrote a memoir called A Hoosier Salad that is like a whole, it's so weird, it's just a lot of really quippy one-liners, that's who Thomas Marshall was. And so he wanted no part of the presidency, but he also really didn't want to be seen as usurping it illegally. So this goes on. Um, this is Robert Lansing. So uh, William Jennings Bryan did reside as Secretary of State over the German sinking of Lusitania. Robert Lansing took the post. 
he was never a great fit. Um, he resented that Wilson more or less acted as his own chief uh, secretary of state. He felt he should have had more responsibility in Paris. He was ready to quit. And then Wilson had a stroke and he got sort of stuck and couldn't quit. He was the really only person in the cabinet saying, I can't run my department. The executive branch is completely hobbled. Where is the president? And he kind of raised the alarm, um, which resulted in a story that is actually the prologue of the book now of uh, bringing a couple of senators to the White House to kind of eyeball the president and see how he was, which resulted in this insane kind of weekend at Bernie's moment where they propped him up in bed and covered his left hand and lit the room so that no one could really see him all that well and sort of hoped for the best. It's, it's a farcical moment, um, but I will not ruin that for you if you do want to read the book. So finally, um, it becomes clear that they there are, there were some contemporary news articles saying that Edith was running the government. It's not like the secret was on total lockdown. Interestingly, they weren't all critical. Some of those said, what a wonderful, dutiful wife, you know, keeping her husband in office like this. They finally did feel the need to put out an um, uh, interview with a friendly journalist who would only write what they insisted he write, and this picture accompanied it. She's actually holding his paper steady for him to sign it in this picture. He could not have signed that page without her standing there. This picture is the cover of a lot of stories about Edith because she's sort of leaning over him and it reinforces that, you know, her over his shoulder thing. I chose to use the one of her independent and standing and looking forward because I wanted to emphasize her over him. Um, but this is also a very famous picture now. This is the final portrait painted of Edith during this time while she was acting president. She hated this picture. This hangs at, in the S Street house over the dining room table. And what she didn't like about this picture is she thought it made her look too young, too thin, and too authoritative. Ironic, considering she was running the country. Um, Woodrow Wilson, I think actually one of the most lasting effects of that time period, I don't think he even did anything as acting president that he would have not have done. She knew his priorities quite well. She followed his agenda. She wasn't seizing power for her own means. However, she kept him so isolated that even when she was consulting his judgment, his judgment was terrible because he heard no bad news. And so he thought the nation was still with him. He thought they were clamoring for a League of Nations. He was so deluded in that echo chamber that he even floated the idea of running for re-election in 1920, which is preposterous. He never would have survived that campaign. And even if he had, he would not have won. The nation did not want him. The nation wanted the return to normalcy that Warren Harding was promising. Um, and when Warren Harding won in a landslide, Wilson was gobsmacked. It never occurred to him that the Democrats had gotten so unpopular. So they decide to stay here in Washington. They were the first first couple to retire here in town. Obviously, the Obamas have done it since. They bought that house on S Street. And he only lived a couple more years. He died in 1924. She lived till 1961. She lived 37 more years. And she stayed in that house. And she had every incoming first lady to tea, regardless of party, to sort of welcome them to town. This is a picture of her with President Kennedy. He's handing her a lot of the legacy we are revisiting. That myth of the heroic man with the vision for global peace was Edith's creation. She spent those 30 years really myth-making and burnishing and solidifying that reputation. So um, she then deeded the house to the Trust for Historic Preservation, and you can go see it now. And I want to make sure that I leave time for questions, so I'm going to end the story there. Thank you. I will also say I do have some copies of the book for sale in the other room if you don't have a copy.